Hi, this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to our lectionary Bible study for December the 6th. And we want to begin this morning with a word of prayer. Please join me. Good and gracious God, this season of Advent, we are encouraged to wait and watch and stay awake for you are coming. We pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit, even on this morning, that we might be encouraged by your word. And Lord, we would wait with anticipation. You're coming, coming to each of us individually. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we've got uh, three texts that we're preparing for uh, this Sunday. And the first is Isaiah 41 to 11. I'm not going to read these through, so I hope that you'll take your Bible out, you'll open it uh, to Isaiah uh, 40. Uh, this is a text because we use it so often. Um, people know this text, and you know, it's in Hendel's Messiah, so we uh, know the words, comfort, comfort you, my people. Uh, but before we jump in, take a look at your Bible. Uh, Isaiah 39, you see, is the last chapter of what we call First Isaiah. And you can see uh, that it revolves around a visit from a Babylonian dignitary uh, to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah walks him around the palace and shows him everything. I mean, shows him the silverware, right? <laughs> Takes him into the treasury, uh, shows the war room. I mean, shows him every, he's trying to impress this guy from Babylon. And the chapter then ends by Isaiah telling Hezekiah, um, Babylon is going to come and take it all. But you've just shown this dignitary, Babylon is going to come and take it all because of the sins of Israel. Okay, that's the end of this uh, first Isaiah. 200 years after that, then we've got chapter 40. And so where this first Isaiah takes place before the exile, Chapter 40 is considered second Isaiah, and it comes after the exile, which means here in Isaiah, the exile, uh, the tragedies of Babylon um, destroying uh, Jerusalem isn't told. You have to go to Second Kings. You have to go to other places in the Bible. It's skipped, and yet, boy, it's sort of like a pregnant pause here between 39 and 40. Of course, everybody knows what has happened. Uh, the writer of Isaiah doesn't have to tell. But again, it's 200 years later, and uh, there are all sorts of theories about why the length. But here now you've got the prophecies of Isaiah now being interpreting this return then to Jerusalem. And we start with comfort, comfort ye my people. I'm going to just read a section here. It says, comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term that her penalty is paid and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. It's like second Isaiah is saying um, and putting in the words of God that uh, the punishment went too far, it went too far. And it picks up themes um, that we read in Lamentations where uh, the writer of Lamentations says, uh, this is too much, uh, <laughs> we're getting, punished too harshly for our sins. And uh, this must have been part of the rumbling at the time. Does the punishment uh, equal the deed? Uh, and, and Isaiah's addressing that where God says, okay, when I give punishment in the hands of an empire like Babylon or Egypt or Rome, sometimes uh, the empire goes too far. And so comfort, comfort, speak tenderly to Jerusalem is how we begin this text. And so then they, respond uh, to the second portion here that's quite well known, which will be picked up in our gospel lesson. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be lifted up and every mountain shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. What it's saying here, actually this is not directed, this text, to Israel in the sense of we're going to build a highway for you to return to Jerusalem. No, it's actually the highway is meant for the Lord. The Lord will return uh, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be present among his people. It's as if the Lord's been away, has been in hiding. And you can imagine the people as they've struggled, 
in Babylon have asked that question, where is the Lord? Where is the Lord? And without the temple, without the sacrificial uh, system, uh, they said, well, you know, God's presence is in the temple, right? And, and God is hidden. God is gone at because the temple's been destroyed. So in a, in a way, this is a very comforting text where God says, I'm coming, I'm coming back, coming back to Jerusalem. So every, every highway is going to be set up so that God can return to Jerusalem where, where he will be accessible for his people again. And so what is Israel's response? We see this um, in verse six, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. The cottons is like the flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the breath of the Lord blows upon us. Surely the people are grass. So he, here you have this lament about how vulnerable they are. Um, but now he says, uh, get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, even though you've been having these laments, but now I'm coming, you will see me, you will see my glory. So you get up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald the good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Oh, Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. So in other words, they're to become preachers. How about that? They're to become preachers of God coming again in their midst. So um, that's delightful. We want to move from then Isaiah to 2 Peter. You know, in 2 Peter, you know, when was the last time you read 2 Peter, right? Uh, often these small books at the end of the New Testament, um, it's easy to uh, uh, overlook them. But 2 Peter is this beautiful text about this, these home churches um, who are struggling, right, in Asia Minor. And they've struggled for numerous reasons. But in 2 Peter, what we see is they were expecting the Lord to come back. And so this idea of the day of the Lord, again, is playing itself out that we read about in Isaiah and uh, Zechariah. And here in First Peter, um, the people are wondering, okay, wait a minute, Jesus is supposed to come back, and he hasn't. Uh, what do we do? What do we do? And they started to doubt. We get that. And then false teachers came in who were mostly looking for what the text says, money and sex, using their Christian freedom for a, a uh, profligate lifestyle. And so the writer here, Peter, is saying, now don't be fooled by these teachers. Uh, they're false teachers. Uh, they're bringing in um, conflict into the church and they're misinterpreting. And this is important. They're misinterpreting Paul. Paul says, you know, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Well, they're misusing that freedom. Here's what's going to happen. The day of the Lord is coming. So this time of judgment, the Lord will come back. Be patient. In fact, God is being patient by not coming back. Uh, it's a way of extending grace to people because he wants all people to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. So this is um, a, quite a text uh, from, from Peter writing to these churches, encouraging them to stay faithful. And even though he says the day of the Lord is coming, this, this end time, his focus is really on holy living. He's saying, you know, um, be prepared. Uh, don't follow the way of these uh, new teachers that are uh, upsetting you. Uh, but rather live as people of the day and not as people of the night. So First Peter frames this encouragement to holy living uh, within this context of struggle within these small house churches and the fact that Jesus had not yet come back and the, and the anxiety that it created in the community. So that's our second text. And the third comes from Mark. 1 verses 1 to 8. Here's John the Baptist. Um, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Anytime I hear this text, prepare ye the way of the Lord, I think of God's spell, you know, that first song. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Love that song. Love the musical. Here's John the Baptist, who um, this is how the Gospel of Mark begins. Right? It's not with the birth of Jesus, uh, as it is in Matthew and Luke. And Mark, it starts right out with quoting Isaiah, right? And saying, uh, this is what John the Baptist is doing, is preparing the way of the Lord. And the idea here 
is for us not to lose focus in this text. It's not on us about us preparing, because that was John the Baptist's job. It's rather that, again, God is going to reveal God's self, right? In Isaiah, it was God is going to come back to the temple and be accessible to his people. Here, John the Baptist, it's Jesus who is now going to come as God being accessible to, to the people. So this is a subtle issue, but I think it's an important one in Advent. The focus is not on us preparing, us repenting, us preparing the way of the Lord. It's rather that God is coming. Jesus is coming. God is coming among us, and therefore watch, wait, stay awake. And you notice that John the Baptist uh, garnered a lot of attention, but he's constantly pointing then to the one who's coming, the one whose sandals uh, he's not worthy to unleash. So he keeps the focus on Jesus rather than just on uh, his sermon about repentance. So John the Baptist prepares the way of the Lord, but it is the way of the Lord, just like Isaiah. The path was to set up for God's arrival again in Jerusalem. And of course, for us, it's once again Jesus uh, coming, not just Christmas, not Christmas, it's Jesus coming uh, to us, uh, both uh, the first time, uh, then of course, uh, when he comes into our hearts, and then of course, we await his uh, final coming in glory. That's three beautiful texts. Uh, these are classic uh, Advent texts from Isaiah, from Second uh, uh, Peter, and from Mark chapter 1. I pray that God would uh, bless you as you let these texts just get into your heart and mind as you prepare for worship on Sunday. Blessings to you now. Bye-bye.